Mere Reforms Won't Work An Essay by Eric Schechter 1. Introduction It's hard to face facts when they're contrary to everything that you and most other people have ever believed. We're on the verge of extinction, most likely by climate collapse or nuclear war. It's coming much sooner than the corporate news says. We're being steered toward it by a plutocracy, that is, rule by the rich. The plutocracy disguises itself as democracy. We've never had a real democracy. More about that later. Only a big mistake could get us into such a mess. Only big changes have any chance of getting us out. Our big mistake was 12,000 years ago, when we stopped sharing. More about that later, too. By now, property and fake democracy are so ingrained in our culture that hardly anyone even notices them. Indeed, many reformists say that we are in danger of losing our democracy. Reformists hope to solve our problems of war, poverty, and ecocide through reforms, little changes, working within the system, because they don't see what the system really is. That's not going to work. And there is no hope of persuading the plutocrats to behave better, because our socio-economic system forces them to compete for short-term profits and to disregard how their long-term effects are destroying the world. 2. Property and Power We humans have existed in our present form for about 300,000 years. For most of that time, we were hunter-gatherers, cooperating and sharing as friends and equals. We evolved as social animals, and that is still our nature. Sharing is still what we teach our kids, still where we turn in crisis, still who we are genetically. But 12,000 years ago, the Ice Age ended, and that made immense cultural changes possible. Not necessary, just possible. I'm simplifying here. These changes didn't all happen at once. We began farming and settled in villages and later cities. That may have been a plus. But also we replaced sharing and friendship with private property and cutthroat competition. That was our big mistake. Selfishness, inequality, poverty, violence, and worse have become accepted as normal. And now they're about to kill us all, as I'll explain. We'll only survive by a return to sharing. But that's difficult to even imagine after 12,000 years of separateness. If we don't share, we must trade. For labor, food, rent, whatever. Trade brings greater profits to the trader in the stronger bargaining position, making him stronger still. Thus trade increases inequality, which has become severe. The board game Monopoly, only a slight exaggeration of real life, always ends with all the players but one totally impoverished. Desperate competition at all levels of society makes us all crazy. Some of us become mass murderers, on our own, or in the police, or in the military, or in Congress. Wealth is power, so we get plutocracy. Indeed, Professors Gillens and Page proved statistically that regardless of elections, our laws follow the wishes of the rich, not the general public. The USA has been a plutocracy ever since its so-called founding in land theft, genocide, slavery, and indentured servitude. Plutocracy is much older than the USA, but the USA is the first plutocracy in modern times to strengthen its grip on power by disguising itself as a democracy. That was at least partly intentional. James Madison, the chief author of the Constitution, said that it was important, quote, to keep the spirit and form of popular government 
with only a minimum of the substance. End quote. And power corrupts. We see that at all levels, including workplace bullying and killer cops. At the top levels, the system forces plutocrats to compete against each other for the short-term profits that keep them in power. Our socio-economic system doesn't stop the war or warming, because stopping those would reduce the incomes of weapon makers, polluters, and politicians. Thus, the market is not as wise or efficient as the myths claim. 3. Extinction Runaway global warming has already begun. It was initially triggered by greenhouse gases from human activities, but by now some of the consequences of warming are also causes of further warming. That's called feedback. For instance, warming melts ice, so less sunlight is reflected into outer space. More sunlight is absorbed by Earth. That causes more warming. Feedback causes continuous acceleration. Tipping points cause abrupt acceleration. Both kinds of acceleration make the warming bigger, faster, and harder to stop. But they are rarely mentioned by the corporate press or the IPCC. We're in the end game now. Even if gradual reforms could work, we don't have enough time left for them now. The warming is already causing extreme weather and crop failures. As these increase, civilization will fall. But even after that, feedback will continue raising the temperature, and soon there will be no survivors at all. So please don't talk to me about adapting to the new conditions. Maybe it's not too late to avoid extinction. Some rapid, radical measures implemented right now might still stop the warming and even reverse it. But those measures are not being implemented because they wouldn't make the rich richer. And so the governments, the representatives of the rich, have been ignoring climatologists for decades. Many climate activists have not yet realized that they need to question our economic system. Only a different system might still save us. We must share the task of maintaining the ecosystem. Nuclear war hasn't begun yet, but its likelihood is rising. It could happen as a spin-off from any of the so-called conventional wars that we keep having. Our government, struggling to retain its position as top bully, recently has been talking about winning a nuclear war. But that's madness. The initial blasts would kill half the world in minutes, and then radioactive fallout and nuclear winter would kill the other half of the world in months. As long as our rulers stockpile nukes, it's inevitable that eventually we'll have a nuclear war. It may start accidentally, as in the movie Dr. Strangelove. We've already had many close calls. For instance, look up how Stanislav Petrov saved the world in 1983. We'll only be made safe by universal disarmament, and that requires friendship. That applies not just to war, but also to warming and other methods of extinction. We need community, friendship, cooperation, not cutthroat competition. That's obvious. How did we ever forget it? 4. Lies Lies by politicians and businessmen have been commonplace for thousands of years, but the size and craft of lies took a big leap upward in the 20th century. Edward Bernays, Freud's nephew, taught the military and corporations all sorts of techniques for lying and manipulating. And Adolf Hitler wrote about the big lie, an assertion so big that few would question it. Hitler wrote that the Jews were telling a big lie, but that assertion of Hitler's was itself a big lie. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover 
told a similar lie about the communists. And now the USA's plutocracy is telling similar lies about Russia, China, Cuba, and other countries that do not obey the USA. In Orwell's novel 1984, the military branch of the totalitarian government was called the Ministry of Peace. Around the time when that novel was published, the USA's War Department was renamed the Defense Department, though its mission was not changed. This made it easier for Americans to believe that their military was the good guys in all of the many wars that the USA somehow kept getting into. That illusion has been supported by all of our television and movies. But what's the truth? All the USA's many wars are based on lies to make a few rich men richer. Read Smedley Butler and David Swanson on this subject. So our honored statesmen in both money parties really are thieves and mass murderers. But even after many past lies are exposed, many people somehow believe that this time the government is finally telling the truth. The corporate press lies freely, preceding each lie with the phrase, sources say. And many readers overlook that phrase and believe the lie. The corporate press also constantly lies by omission. It never discusses historical context, nor the real basis of our society, nor the very different world that is possible. And so a real democracy wouldn't be much of an improvement. We can't vote wisely when we are misinformed. We don't even know the right questions to ask. Question everything, even yourself. Are you aware of your own assumptions? In conclusion, we must replace the entire socio-economic system. Only friendship, sharing, and cooperation have any chance of saving us. The first step is to make more people aware of all these things. Help spread the word.